RBGFM, locals talking to locals. And we welcome into our studio this morning the man who's written a book about um, the history of our squadron, number three squadron, RNZAF. And as I say, local Paul Harrison. Good morning, Paul. Welcome to the program. Good morning, Nigel. Well, you'd be delighted to have this book out. Yes, it's been a five and a half year project. So uh, <laughs> seeing it on the streets has uh, been a great relief. Yes. And it's certainly done a lot for my domestic relationship with my wife. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> will be when the income comes in. Yeah, that's right. She yes. became an author's widow again. Yes. Um, no, it's it's been a project which uh, started off originally in 2010 when I had an idea of uh, writing the history of the Iroquois helicopter. Yes because they were then scheduled to be replaced. Uh, but I think that didn't quite take off. But in two th- late 2013, I was approached by Bob Anderson of John Douglas Publishing, right. who said, hey, uh, the history of Three Squadron needs to be written. Uh, would you like to do it? Because I know of your, uh, your historical background and your authorship. And I yes. said, oh, I'd be delighted, because it is a project that I've had going. And we were very lucky in that the Air Force also recognised that this was the one chance to do an official history of the squadron while the Iroquois and a lot of the people that were around the squadron when it first formed, even some of the World War II people, yes. were still alive. So they part funded the book uh, and uh, really in 2014 the research and everything took off. Right. So you spent 35 years in the Air Force, haven't you? So you got the background there. Well, that's right. When I joined the Air Force, the only turbine aircraft we had were the Vampire and the Canberra, yes. and we had no helicopters. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yes, literally uh, the helicopter... Uh, career, I guess, has followed my career. Uh, I was a communications operator, yes. and so I spent a lot of my youth as a very young operator in various holes in the ground at Tekapo and Waieru and other places where the Army played, providing the communications for Three Squadron. So this book is about people, you say? It's a people book, yeah. Yes. When we looked at um, how do we record the history of the squadron, which is a very unique squadron in Air Force history, and, you, and there's two ways that you can do it, of course. You can do it the academic way, and you can have lots of footnotes and things like that. Yes. But fundamentally, the book is about the people, the people who were there, their stories, the machines of various types over the years just form the platform for their adventures. Right. So... It, it really shows uh, what they did and how the, how the aircraft that they used served New Zealand. And remembering that this squadron's history goes right back to 1930 when it was one of the four territorial squadrons that were formed. Yes. They had yeah. people but no aeroplanes. Right. They yeah. didn't get their first aeroplanes until 1938 when the war in Europe was looming. And then they were second-hand ex Royal Navy Baffin biplanes. Um, and then, of course, it was the first New Zealand squadron to engage the Japanese in the southwest Pacific area. In 1942, when the Americans landed at Guadalcanal, they had a major problem in that they had no reconnaissance aircraft. And the Japanese Navy were coming down every night and shelling the Marines and causing all sorts of uh, havoc. And so the New Zealand government was approached and said, can you provide us with some long-range reconnaissance aircraft? Sure. And it just so happened that we were just taking, we had just taken delivery of the first of the Hudson uh, patrol yes. aircraft, yeah. which were ideally suited for that task. And three squadron uh, went to Guadalcanal on the 24th of November 1942, and the first engagement with the Japanese was the day after they had arrived. Goodness. Um, and that was a very fortunate engagement for us because the captain of the aircraft that was flying that day, the Hudson, was the only member of the squadron that had actually seen uh, the Japanese in action because he had been at Singapore and uh, he knew their tactics and what saved him in his aeroplane because the Hudson was attacked by some Japanese fighters was that he knew that the Japanese fighters had two machine guns on the top of the cowl and they fired those first as sighters with tracer before they engaged their 20 millimeter wing cannons which was really going to cause damage yes, yes. and so he was flying the aeroplane he, he stepped out of the pilot seat, gave it to the co-pilot and he stood in the astrodome which which is above on the top of the fuselage, yes. and every time he saw the Japanese aircraft attacking and fire the tracers, he would call him hard right, hard left, and they managed to get away wow. with only a couple of holes in the aeroplane. <laughs> now, just as an aside, 
Of all of the 94 Hudson aircraft that the Air Force had, that aeroplane still exists. Is that right? And it's mm. in a collection of Bill Reed down at Nelson, and he's currently rebuilding it. Excellent. So that was three squadrons' introduction to World War II, and of course yes. they served right through the Pacific Campaign. They then served as a territorial unit from 1948 to 1957 as a Christchurch squadron. That's where the Three Squadron Association is. It's a Canterbury squadron. And their colours, of course, were red and black on their Mustangs. Um, And there's still a Mustang flying in New Zealand today wearing those colours. It's not an ex-Air Force one, but it's painted in those colours. Yeah, sure. And in 57, of course, um, we had the magic black budget and Nordmeyer canned the territorial forces. (laughs) So they went into recession. But then in 1960, with the introduction of helicopters and a new squadron was going to be formed, the then Chief of Air Staff decided that it would be Number 3 Squadron, which coincidentally was the last wartime squadron that he had commanded. Now, I'm not saying that he influenced it at all, but that's the way it came. And then again, that was in a unique uh, formation for the New Zealand Defence Forces in that it was the first Air Force squadron to have naval and army personnel totally integrated Integrated, into the squadron. Because at that time, of course, we had just got the Leander-class frigate, the fixed-wing aeroplanes flying with three squadrons, and the Bristol freighters, and a couple of Harvards. So the they, the fixed-wing aeroplanes all disappeared off in 1972 when the, the, the Austers had virtually been written off except for one. Um, we still got that? No, yes, it's in civilian hands and yes. it's still painted in Air Force colours. Right. And then the... Um, the Harvards went to uh, down to 75 squadron when forward air control, the the Vietnam type uh, forward air control was uh, up and running, so they took those two aeroplanes over, yes. and the Bristol freighters went across to Fanuapai and formed uh, Number One Squadron. So from 1972 to the current day, three squadron has been a pure helicopter squadron. Sure, those Harvards. Of course, when I was down at Wigram, they used to that was for their training aircraft. Wonderful sound. Oh, there's only one you sound. You couldn't hear about. anything else around you. <laughs> and we used to knock off at half past 11 because of the cloud of smoke coming out of Christchurch, but back to action again just after lunch. Yeah, that's right. You either, if you're a Cantabrian, you either loved them or hated them. Yes, that's right. I think the Cantabrians hated them, to be quite honest, but we loved the sound. I actually flew one of those. They used to bring them up, you know, for the air training cause. Yep. And um, we used to fly in them as, as kids virtually. I was only about 12, 13, 14, I suppose. But they were quite an efficient aircraft to fly you know I've been flying uh, pipers and of course you use the full hand on the joystick well I got there and he says right you take control have a bit of fun with it so I took control of it with a full hand and I had the plane all over the sky he said no no you only need the thumb and your finger to fly this plane <laughs> so this book here though I see you got the Bell helicopter in there as well well look, the Iroquois of course um, was when it was introduced into service in New Zealand in 1966 was the the biggest lifting helicopter in New Zealand. So from the late 60s through to the early 80s, the Iroquois not only carried out its military tasks, but did a lot of commercial and government tasks. Um, Commercial lifts of... uh, There's a photograph in there of lifting an air conditioning unit onto the top of the meatworks down at the bottom in the Ronga Gorge. Uh, They did a lot of uh, work for the electricity department, stringing... uh, Pylons and lines through from the Manapuri uh, power project in the in the, those days. Uh, dock, of course, they did a tremendous amount of work with dock lifting huts and uh, lifting equipment and helping the helping with research on various animals and things. Uh, fisheries, of course, they did a lot of fisheries work. Um, the police with the cannabis uh, operations, yes. uh, chasing baddies and things like that. There's some quite interesting anecdotal stories in there about about chasing. Uh, bad guys with the, with the Iroquois helicopters, which must have been quite fascinating. Yes, um, but of course their rather main task until the eighties, when uh, civilian rescue helicopters took over, was search and rescue. And in that, uh, in the, the book, there are a number of stories uh, of obviously very successful rescues, but also a lot of sad occasions where they were recovering bodies off the side of mountains and lost trampers and and those sorts of things. But it's told again uh, through the experiences of those who flew and serviced the the aircraft. So you're still involved as a historian? 
Yes, unfortunately. Or the Air Force, that is. Uh, I get asked occasionally to, to, to assist with Air Force projects, but yes. I do a lot of um, personal uh, research that people ask me to look oh, up right. various items and things. Yes. Uh, I'm also a, a correspondent for New Zealand Aviation News and do a lot of historical articles uh, in there. And you're also the Chief Executive Officer for the Kapiti Districts Area Club. Yes, I was. For yeah. a number of years. Yeah, for four years I, yes. I was in, uh, running the, the Aero Club and the Aero Academy. So now you're retired, you're just going to write books? Uh, yes, that's if the domestic manager will <laughs> allow me to <laughs> that privilege. Hey, this is a fantastic yeah, book, yeah. beautifully presented too, the illustrations it, it is, of the yeah. planes. You yeah, know. 353 illustrations. Yes. One of the other interesting aspects of the book is there are four appendices. Um, the first one is the history of the New Zealand Army Aviation Corps. Now that oh, yes. that was a unique part of the Army, yeah. uh, and the, their history has never been recorded. And it just so happened when I started writing the book that Lieutenant Colonel Roger Pierce retired, who was an Army aviator, uh, had done a lot of research, and he... he had done the research but obviously had no way of publishing it and I came along right at the moment, right time. So his appendix is this first appendix. The second one is the, the story of our pilots who went to Vietnam because right. the RNZAF sent a number of pilots to serve with the Australian No. 9 Squadron, Helicopter Squadron, uh, and uh, they were X3 Squadron people. So that falls naturally within the, the, the scope of the book yes. because a lot of the techniques that they brought back from Vietnam were adopted by the squadron in terms of their operational flying. Um, then we have the, the helicopters in Singapore. Again, uh, the three squadron people provided the, the maintenance people and the air crew for the helicopter units in Singapore, which went from 1971 through to 1989. So we're there a long time. Uh, then there's the, uh, the MFO and the Sinai, where again weren't our helicopters, but they were our maintainers and were our, our air crew. So all of the places where three squadron personnel have served with helicopters and things uh, are recorded in the book. Fantastic book, Paul Harrison, uh, folks. A history of three squadron RNZAF. It's Seek and Destroy is dedicated to all those who gave their lives in service with number three squadron Royal New Zealand Air Force in War and Peace. And it's beautifully put together. And the book's on the shelves now at Whitcalls, you say? Whitcalls and Paper Plus. Seek and Destroy, folks. Pick up a copy. It's well worth reading, and it's not going to be an easy read. I mean, you, you'll pick it up. There's so much information in there, but the photos are absolutely marvellous too. Paul, we thank you very much for that, and look forward to having a chat when you get your next book out. OK. If you're still married. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Yes, it's a big job, huge job. So there we are, folks. Seek and destroy the history of number three RNZF Squadron. Put out by our local historian, Paul, here on Beach FM. 106.3 Beach FM.